Gentlemen, welcome. Looking forward to the conversation. You gonna be able to get through this? I am. <laughs> I love this conversation. Okay, it's a conversation about multi-site and specifically kind of what the village is doing, not kind of, but what the village is doing yeah. in and around multi-site. In short, what we're doing with multi-site is transitioning all of our campuses to become local autonomous churches. But before we get to that, I wanna talk about, has this always been the playbook? Has this always been how we uh, thought about multi-site when we started back in 2007? Was this, was this in, in our view? Were we thinking, man, we're gonna transition them off at some point? You know, it, it was a possibility, yeah. but it certainly wasn't the plan. I think that's the best way to say it. I mean, we left the door open for that, like we don't know how this is gonna end, this is a possibility, but we certainly didn't start multi-site going, this is a church plan. Yeah, this is a long term. Goal. Yeah, and I think multi site wasn't a plan either altogether. Right. So, certainly, the specifics of what we would do with multi site, we never planned to do multi site. In fact, we had planned to do the opposite. We were hoping to do the opposite, but then when yeah. we get given a building in the middle of six weeks of prayer and fasting, it's uh, hard to do anything but humbly receive that as maybe God's leadership yeah. toward what yeah, was so multi site. The, the short of that was we're in a season of prayer and fasting. We're up against it as a church in so many ways. That season is called venture. <clears throat> We're asking the Lord to do something that only the Lord can do. Uh, week one, we pray, we gather, it's powerful, it's amazing. Week two, we have a meeting. You have a meeting with the pastor of a church in Denton who says, we would like to become part of the Village Church, giving you this building and you becoming multi-site. So that kind of forced us into a philosophy that we weren't ready to really walk into. Yeah but did believe that this was an answer uh, to the collective prayers of his people at the Village Church. And so that, that's how we got to become yeah, a Yeah, and I think that's where the ambiguity really all the way through for the first seven, eight years of it remained, where I, I do remember the first couple of times we were together with that congregation, becoming one with them, becoming a campus, and Matt saying as much that, hey, we're, we're not sure where this is going. Maybe it's one of those things where in a couple of years we transition to be a church and yet there was no there was no clarity around yeah. that it was just really the uh, yeah the, the the authenticity to say we don't know where this is going but we're stepping into it in faith yeah. together and uh, and i think it kind of remained that way uh you know and then we added another campus and added another campus and then added another campus and then began to really think through on the back side okay wh how do we want to steward this yeah so what we, you pioneered the first campus. Thanks the for first, that. Thank you. Yeah. The first campus pastor at the Denton campus. And we didn't stop there. And we added Dallas and then we added Fort Worth and then we added Plano um, and then now South Lake. And so all along the way, we, we really did become a multi-site church. And, and our philosophy was in and around that. And there's a lot of great, beautiful stories that came out of the yeah. Village Church being a multi-site church. Well, and I think part of the story that we haven't told well is that, you, you know, it was actually the fruit of what we were seeing in Denton, totally. where there were people becoming Christians, disciples being made, you know, like as we watched you guys work with the schools there, as we watched like real, genuine fruit born, uh, that, that we thought, oh, hey, this is not what we thought. And then that led to Dallas. So, so there was that space where we saw what God was doing in Denton and said, this is good and right. And, and therefore, let, let's give some more attention to maybe doing another one of these. So let's talk a little bit just about some of those strengths and weaknesses of yeah. multi-site. This is gonna have to be a big broad uh, a brush uh, that we're just kind of painting and glossing over here because there's so many nuances, there's so many differences. So, so we could we say, it. what are the strengths and weaknesses of the way we did yeah, multi-site? Let's do that. I Let's do that. To... So what are some things that, and, and Bo, you jump in here because you experienced it on the ground at a level uh, that, that uh, is unique. And I think your perspective is really helpful. What were some of the really great things about being a campus? Well, I mean, I think for me, being the first one, one of the really great things was that there was no playbook. You know, there were very few churches. I mean, there were some um, more than we probably were aware of at the time that yeah. were doing it. But for the way we were engaging it and stepping into it, there was... There was really no framework for what I was to be doing, what a campus was to be. And so the freedom that was there uh, was, was such a benefit, even to be able to contextualize ministry in different ways. Uh, certainly that had a, 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 a lid to it, you know, as a multi-site church that was from day one primarily video. Uh, but I, I, think, I think it was just the joy of being able to step in and say, okay, what can an expression of this local church, the village church, look like in a context that was so very different. I mean, it's 15 minutes up the road, 12 miles, 
but it's night and day in terms of, it might as well be another world in terms of the cultural differences between the two. And so that was, that was a strength, was being able to step in and, uh, and live out uh, life as a church, uh, expressing certainly out of the same core values, theological beliefs, but a different expression altogether in a different context. Okay, I, I want to talk about this as, as we think about uh, the village being a multi-site church and that we, we really did become that. And there was a lot of great things with that and some challenges with that. And, but I want to start on the things here at the village that were real strengths of being multi-site. And I think, Bo, you're probably uh, the best one to answer this because this is the, the air that you breathe day in and day out. So what, what strengths did you see uh, in Denton being a multi-site church campus. Yeah, and I think my my being the first campus and first campus pastor, my experience was a little different, but uh, I think for starters, it was just the freedom. Uh, not having a framework for multi-site, not knowing what we were to be doing as a campus pastor or as a campus, and being given that freedom to just go up there and figure it out, in yeah. a sense. What is this expression of multi-site going to begin to look like here at the village? And so, you know, being in a context that it's 15 minutes away, and yet it might as well be night and day in terms of the culture from where the village was in Highland Village, that freedom was such a joy and a gift. And I think other things as well, I think that the, the connectivity... Uh, to, to uh, other leaders, you know, sharing burdens across the leadership spectrum. I think one of the most significant things we did was keeping me as a campus pastor in those spaces, yeah. in those rooms from day one, uh, where, you know, anything that was going on in the life of the church, I was a part of those conversations and thus uh, not only shaping, you know, that vision altogether, but certainly the implication of it for our campus. And so that was really well uh, uh, really a good thing, I think, about the way that we did it. But uh, the other thing I think about a lot is even just Titus, you know, where Paul would write to Titus and say, I want you to, I want you to appoint elders in every city. And so that, that sort of space and energy and time to developing leadership for the campus while not having the burden, at least initially, of preaching, uh, you know, uh, and preaching very often, that, that gave me the space to to establish some culture within the congregation there, the campus, to, uh, to identify, to begin to raise up men and women to help serve in significant ways. All of that was, uh, was great about how we did it. And, and I'm, those are fond years for me, and, and I'm really grateful for all the fruit uh, and the friendship, and I could just go on and on about uh, what the Lord has really done over the last 10 years since we've been a multi-site church. There have been challenges. Uh, when you pick a model, right? Yep. Uh, there's going to be some things that are really strong about that model, and then there's going to be some limitations or some challenges. Let, let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges or weaknesses or limitations of being multi-site, at least in our context, the way that we have done it. Yeah. Um, open game, who wants to chat about it? Well, I, I mean, I can speak to one end of it, yeah. and, and maybe you can speak to the other. I, I think where, where I would feel constrained, being the primary teacher to all these locations, is there were either contextual realities that I'm not aware of. Yeah. Um, and, and then on top of that, there was no way for me to read um, how what I was saying was being received by the people that were sitting in front of me. So when you're preaching live, at least when I'm preaching live, uh, I can get a sense of, um, it, is this too heavy? Do I need to ease up here? Or... Is this too light? Do I need to bear in so they can feel the weight of what we're talking about here? Um, and in, in our model, there was just no way to do that. And so I could be saying something here that, that I, I felt like I would really need to bear in on. And then other campuses be like, yeah, that, we, yeah. we were wondering why you were so upset. And I was like, well, man, I wasn't upset at all. Uh, and so there were just little things like that that then began to make me feel constrained to where I couldn't even, I felt like I couldn't minister to the people that were sitting right in front of me for fear of how that would affect, yeah. you know, other people. these other campuses yeah. where, man, I, I, I love them because they're us, but I don't know them. I don't, I'm not visiting them in the hospital like I am this. I'm not praying with them between services like I am at Flower Mound. I'm not. So, so these were the kind of weaknesses for me as the primary teacher that, that really made me in a real way feel constrained in my ability to love who God had put in front of me. Yeah, so it's kind of the maxim that our shepherding informs our preaching, yeah. our preaching informs our shepherding. That, that there's truth in that. There is. And, and so those are some of the, the challenges or limitations, but what did you sense, feel, experience in that as well? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think from the same 
from a different perspective, but I think some of the same things. And even just, uh, especially now, this side of it, uh, looking back, I think I'm able to sort of think through more because in the moment, it's like there was a lot of fruit, there was a lot of excitement, there was a lot of encouragement. Uh, but I think on this side of things, uh, and I think there still needs to be a lot of theological thought done and even writing and work done about it. But like you said, separating out, okay, this guy's going to be my teacher because he's significantly more powerful as a teacher, right. you know, and this guy can be my pastor. What you do when you separate pastor teacher um, theologically and sort, sort of otherwise, um, there's implications, I think, that Matt felt, but I think there's implications that the church felt. And, so I think, uh, and I think there's implications that even within a vision to multiply, to, to, to raise up more, uh, uh, certainly, preachers and pastors, uh, that it just uh, it put a ceiling on yeah. it in a way that, I, and again, on this side of it, as I'm looking at it now, it, it almost feels unnatural. Yeah. Um, let me let me chime in on that because I'm thinking uh, so that your perspective there, your perspective there, my perspective um, was was similar but a little bit unique in that what I saw the most, especially interacting with Bo, is a leader who had more in him. Yeah. And and a team, a group of elders, a staff that just couldn't get past some of those contextual ceilings. That, Not that we you were probably seeing him more clearly than we were in some yeah. ways. Well. Okay. Yeah. I, um, but I mean, they we were just felt there. Them. Yeah. They were just there. And, and, and to know, man, if you could just move the lid over and let this congregation, let this pastoral team, these elders, this staff, these deacons go and do and lead and, and approach ministry the way that they feel like they need to approach it for the sake of these people, yeah. what would happen? Um, and I think with all the confidence in the world, we're, we're answering that question, what would happen? And we're saying it would be good. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be really good. Uh, and it has been. And so this conversation isn't one disparaging multi-site. I mean, multi-site provided us the platform to do this. Uh, and, and it really allowed us to have campuses kind of like a long-term church planning strategy. And so I've kind of already, you know, uh, leaked out the next answer to the question, which is what are we doing now? So in light of this, what, what are we doing with our campuses. And Matt, you want to answer that? Yeah, you know, there's been a growing conviction for an extended period of time um, that as good as what we're in the middle of is. And, and again, I, I think my, my disappointments, even around the rollout of what we feel God leading us to do, has been in a sense some celebration uh, of those who are anti-multi-site. This isn't a theological conviction. Uh, like like we, don't, we don't have a theological issue with multi-side, but, but rather we just think this is that what the Lord has for us tomorrow is better than what he has for us today. Um, that he's moving us into a season of trust and moving us into a season of believing um, that, that what we'll leave behind in regards to autonomous local churches that are highly contextualized in their neighborhoods, in their places, in the city, uh, are just going to be better at making disciples, seeing people come to know Jesus Christ, and, and really affecting neighborhoods and places within the Metroplex far better than we would ever be able to do with just yeah. kind of our centralized multi-site model. Yeah. And, and so I, I, couldn't be, I, I couldn't be more excited for, I, I, I do think that we're just about on the precipice of needing to rethink how the American church does ministry in the day and age that we're in. So probably 10 years out here in the South, maybe already there in, in other parts of the U.S. And, and, and to show hospitality in a given location over an extended period of time, showing care for the city or area in which you live in, um, it is just going to win the day better than dynamic preaching. I mean, even if you start looking at the data now, like, like my, my daughter's age, like my high school daughter's age, like they're not wooed by dynamic preaching. They want to feel like they belong. They want to feel like they're known. They want to feel like they're safe. And then, and man, if you're not contextualizing ministry around your given location and all you've got is a real dynamic preacher, really dynamic music, you're going to lose, uh, I think, the capacity um, to, to light the kind of gospel lights that we want to light in, in the days in which we live. And so uh, love that we're heading this direction, expecting a lot of fruit in this direction and um, eager to see what the Lord's going to do. So that direction is, is over the next five years, the village will intentionally move to transition all of our current campuses to become local autonomous churches. We have five campuses. Yep. 
and by God's grace in five years will trans five years or less transition each one of those campuses off to become its own local church. The first campus that we did that with, obviously, was Bose and, uh, and and the Denton campus, which is two years in, and so and still alive and still alive and flourishing and flourishing. Anyways. So talk about that. So just quickly, just hit on some of the high points, some of the challenges, some of the struggles, and and we'll start to end our conversation here and thinking about what's it been like post village. Yeah, I think we're still learning, uh, and I think. You know, the village, you, you, you brothers and, and, and the other campuses did such a wonderful job equipping us and sending us out that honestly, the struggles have been minimal. I mean, for me, from my perspective, a lot of it's just been more me dealing with my fears, my own insecurities yeah. and what's this going to be like. And certainly th those were rooted in some truth. I mean, we had never made budget or at least as, as best we understood our budget as a campus, we had never really... Yeah reached it. And so what was that going to be like? And what are the implications going to be? Certainly transitioning and unplugging Matt from the screen 40 times out of the year, that's a massive transition, uh, especially when you've spent 10 years allowing that be to be really front and center of your philosophy of ministry. And so, so I think those challenges, they, they haven't really been as challenging as maybe they could have been, or maybe we feared that they would be. Uh, but those were things still to work through emotionally and otherwise uh, for myself and others. But uh, but I think some of the wins have just been, uh, you know, uh, it is in a way that it, it makes sense when you stop to think about it, like a kid sort of moving out of the house. But it has forced our congregation uh, since the conversation began to now, two years later, to just grow up in ways that um, we, we would have never been spurred forced, provoked to grow up as a, as a campus. And, and, and in some ways we couldn't have yeah. uh, grown up uh, just with, with the model kind of and the that. philosophy yeah. of ministry yeah. coming back to that ceiling. And so to watch them, uh, the congregation, including the elders and deacons, grow up together in all these different ways and own the ministry of the church in ways that either they, they, just, they just weren't going to as long as they were sort of there uh, with, with the others as a campus or they couldn't for one reason or another. Uh, it's been incredible. And then I think the thing that's been maybe most surprising this side of it uh, for a number of reasons is that, you know, there are now um, more non-believers that we're aware of in our services than we've, than we've ever been aware of before. And I don't, I don't mean to say that there's more non-believers that are there. It's just that we're aware of them because by and large now, uh, one of the only, if not the, you know, one of the primary, if not the only reasons that they're there is because somebody's inviting them. Yeah. And so it has provoked, compelled, um, forced us out of the sort of uh, come and see mindset of a campus into the go and tell mindset. And hopefully it's either or. I mean, yeah. we're still wanting to welcome and we're, yeah. there are people that still step in For and sure. come and see. But, but in terms of our DNA, our mindset, you know, as often as we've preached about it, this structural change, becoming, a, you know, a church from a campus, it really did compel us into that. And we're just seeing lots of fruit from that. And, in the, you know, to Matt's point, you know, where we're at in Denton, right across the street from a major liberal arts university, right down the street from another major liberal arts university, is that we're seeing this generation, this emerging generation, everybody talks about the millennials, I mean, even the ones behind them, yeah. and then behind them, Maybe whatever we're calling them, uh, we're seeing they're, they're more drawn to uh, creational, incarnational ministry. And I mean creation in the sense of, you know, uh, incarnation, you know, right, right there connected to, to, to flesh and blood. And, uh, and so that's, that's just been surprising. Uh, I just wouldn't have thought those things in the ways that we've seen them. Well, let me say this and I'll close with this. Just, um, we get the question, uh, do you think other multi-site churches should consider this? And, and I think the short answer is, yeah, I think, I think you should consider it. Um, it doesn't mean that we think it, this is mandated that, that you do this. But there is, there is a stewardship responsibility of, of asking the question, what's on the other side of this model yeah. for your church? Um, so it, for us, it's a proactive succession planning. It's long-term church planning strategy. And uh, to say that we're excited about it is, is to, to undersell it. Yeah. Um, this, this vision has been uh, one of the more energizing visions no uh, in the life of the Village Church. And so, uh, Bo, thanks for being the tip of the spear and, yep. and leading the way again, again, and uh, you're a faithful brother, and have done it really well, and have given us a model and a man to look to, uh, in in so many ways as an example. So you know this, I love you, I'm grateful for you, and so Matthew, thanks for the conversation. Always love being yeah. here. Enjoyed it. <laughs>